I just want to tell you guys, um, my, my heart is so full this morning. It's just so full. Do you ever have those places where you are just being loved on God in such a way that you can't describe it? I love Christmas and um, I'm loving this season of God just taking care of me in ways that I can't explain. And I don't want to rush past this moment with you. And I think sometimes in an effort to just get her going, that we don't take a minute and, and stop. And yeah, we've worshiped and all that, but, but just take a minute for yourself and realize we're sitting and standing in the presence of an almighty God with a message for us that's desperately needed for someone today. So I just, wanna, I just wanna pause for a minute and have us all just step in with him again real quick. Father, I thank you for who you are. And it's hard for me to fathom what you've already done before this even starts, that you are working, you are moving, you have brought someone here to this place today, to this moment today, this exact time to receive your message, your word, the change for their life that they need. God, you are amazing. And Jesus, we thank you that we have access to our Father through you, for your gift to us. So it's in your name that we pray, amen. Okay, well, I thought I'd get crazy and start today by reading something out of the Bible. Is that okay with you guys? So we're gonna jump right into our passage here today. This is a famous passage of scripture around this time of year, around Christmas time. This is written by Dr. Luke, a follower of Jesus Christ, a man passionate about Jesus. So I'm gonna invite you to stand up with me. We're jumping into Luke chapter two. Luke chapter two. I'm gonna start in verse eight and you guys can follow along with me. So. Luke's writing here and he says, and there are shepherds living out in the fields nearby. They're in Bethlehem. And they were keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. This big, bright lights bursting all around them. And these dudes lost their love and mind. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid I'm bringing you good news of great joy that's going to be for all people. Today, in the town of David, Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Lord. And this is going to be a sign to you. You're going to find this baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, out of nowhere, the whole sky fills up with this great company of heavenly hosts. And they appeared with this angel and they were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. And on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, What? What happened? Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they boogied down to Bethlehem and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word. They spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned. They were glorifying. They were praising. They were high-fiving. And they were praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been 
told. You guys can have a seat. I think this would be a good time to honor any shepherds we have in the house today. No shepherds today. Okay. Listen, isn't it amazing how our God works? I want to tell you guys something, a little something as we get into this about shepherds back in the day. Okay. You know, let's just, let's just tell it like it is here. Shepherds, these dudes were like the degenerates of society, man. They were right up there with con men, crooks. These guys were trusted so little that their testimony was not even allowed in a court of law. And our God decides to make the announcement of the Savior of the world coming. To guys just like this on a hillside somewhere outside Bethlehem. Listen, if you have ever felt unwanted, unnoticed, rejected, dejected, take great hope in God and who he is because he loves the least of these. He loves them. And I love the fact that it was shepherds, that it was shepherds who the angels made this announcement to. Awesome stuff. So today we're in this series. We've been talking about the light of the world. We've talked about the light that brings hope. We've talked about the light that brings pe- or light that brings love. And today we're going to be talking about the light that brings peace. The light that brings peace. So today's sermon title is Peace Out. So look at your neighbor and say, peace out, homie. Just give him a little peace out. Peace out to everybody. But don't leave. Don't leave. No leaving. Peace out. So when we're talking about peace right here, Christmas is the story of God's light bringing peace on earth. And now what we just read, right? It's what the angels out announced. Peace on earth. You know? Isn't that an awesome thing? Aren't we thankful for God's peace on earth? Amen. Yeah. And we all know this is exactly what it looks like. You know? This is when Jesus visited, evidently, New England, up there, fall time. You know, he's got his pet lamb that we all know he carried around all the time for some reason. It's in every uh, picture of him. But, uh, you know, this is, this is what we think of when we think of the Prince of Peace, right? I mean, this is Jesus. Everything's cool. Everything's hunky-dory. And that's, you understand what the artist is trying to convey, right? But come on, man, let's be honest. Is, is this a picture of peace on earth today? Is this what's happening in your neighborhood? When you turn on the news at night, is this the vibe that you're getting from peace on earth? Uh, it's not certainly what I'm seeing. So what's going on? Because to me, this is a more accurate picture of peace on earth right now. We got the international symbol of peace here, the dove rocking the flak jacket and the sniper rifle pointed at it, you know? Do you guys know where this picture was taken? This is a wall in graffiti in Bethlehem. And many of us took a tour there just a few weeks ago and there was graffiti on a lot of the walls and isn't that fascinating that in the place where the Savior was born, to bring peace on earth, that this is a representation of what is happening in that place. Kind of blew my mind. Because I thought, that's so real. Isn't there always something trying to take our peace out? Even when we get it, it's always something trying to snipe us down. We recently just bought a house, you know? I mean, that's supposed to be like, we've been in the same house 19 years, and we're, we're, we're getting into this house. It's supposed to be this awesome, joyful time. Dude, it was nuts, man. Things always trying to bring me down. You're trying to get a loan, and these people now need, like, a note from your third grade teacher, your bank account when you were five, uh, doctor's records, and you're like, what is going on? Answering the phone all day, trying to take care of that. We finally get that all settled. And we're trying to actually move into the house. And, you know, I moved a lot when I was a kid. I mean, a lot. And so Jacob's family, we don't play around with the moving. It's like, let's get her done, baby. We are up. We got the boxes done. We are going. So my wife had to call me during the move. I I tried to shoot for like half hour, 45 minutes. Let's get this thing done, baby. And she's like, honey, I just got to tell you, you're freaking the kids out. (laughs) 
You're freaking the kids out. You're in spaz mode. Let's dial it down. So we get into the house, and it's awesome, and we're loving it. It's a beautiful place. And I think it's the second night, my daughter comes in, and she's like, Dad, I think I got the car stuck. I'm like, dude, what are you talking about, dude? You got the car stuck. <laughs> this child robbing my peace. I come out. We have a huge driveway, and somehow she has managed to drive her car completely off the drive into the now swampy side yard and decided to keep revving the wheels to try to get it out. I'm like, dude, you're killing me, man. You're killing me, robbing my peace. Thankfully, we got a head start on the swimming pool we're going to put in there next year with the big <laughs> holes we left in the yard. You know, Robin are always, man. It, you guys know what I'm talking about? Something trying to shoot our peace, this peace of God that we've been promised, that we've been promised. So what I want to do today is, if you know me, if you've ever heard me talk up here, we're keeping it simple, man. Get your crayons out. John's up here speaking. It's not going to be all that. I want to try to keep it simple for you guys. That's how God keeps it for me. And we're going to talk about what the peace of God isn't and what it is. And how we can experience this more in our life. So what I want to start with is this. is, is just a simple fact that the peace of God is for followers of Jesus. I think a lot of times what happens, you know, with us... And certainly what the world is, you know, where's this peace God promised? Well, that peace is promised for people that follow Jesus. And even those of us that claim to follow him when we're not, that peace isn't going to be there. Pastor Jim talked about this in his sermon last week when we were looking at our main passage that we've been dealing with. We've been in John 8, 12 for a while now, right? And, and Jesus is speaking here and what he'd say, I'm the light of the world, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life there's a condition there you know so sometimes in our life you know where we hear people talking about not experiencing peace we're not experiencing peace and the first thing we have to ask is am i even following jesus or am i trying to pick and choose the things that are important to me from the bible so we need to start there the peace of god is for followers of jesus and then one thing that I always like to do, it's important that we define what things are not, okay? So we're gonna talk first about what the peace of God is not. Isn't this sometimes just as important as what something is? Okay, I don't know about you guys, so again, I'm not the brightest bulb in the box. So uh, my wife was gone one time, and being the wonderful, caring husband I am, there's some dishes in the sink, I'm like, I'm gonna hook this girl up, I'm gonna put these in the dishwasher, get it done for her, and went to get the thing going, and we were out of dishwashing detergent. No problem, because we got some palm olive dishwashing soap here on the sink. <laughs> Grab the thing, squirt some in the dishwasher, dishes, ah. it was all liquid to me, man. I don't know if you guys have experienced the greatest show on TV, The Brady Bunch. I know it's old, but listen, greatest show ever made, Brady Bunch. The episode where Bobby tries to wash his own clothes with the wash machine and the bubbles go all through the room. That's what I came out to, man. I came out to bubbles galore and I learned a valuable lesson. Dishwashing soap is not the same as dishwashing detergent. Important to know. So we're going to look right now what the peace of God is not. And the first thing that we, we have to know is this. The peace of God is not God giving us what we want. Like, oh, man, I know that. But, I mean, do you really know that? When you think about how we pray and how we talk and the things that we complain about, at least I do, man, God, if you could just give me this, whatever it is, the boyfriend, you know, the car, the da-da-da-da-da, I'd be happy, right? And we actually use verses from Scripture to try to support this, you know? And, and if we really read the Bible like adults in its context, you could never find it in there, but we do it anyway. We do it. It's natural. You know, God, I would be at peace if I could just get this. It's almost like we think that God, for some reason, is up in heaven serenading us with that Spice Girls song. 
So tell me what you want, what you really, really want. I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. I want a new car. I want a new job. I want an Xbox, iPhone. Give me, give me, give me, give me. <laughs> Spice Girls fans. I knew it. I knew it. That's not what the peace of God is about. I mean, let's just look at Jesus' life. Let, right when he was born, no room in the inn, born in a manger. You know, is, is that what was wanted? You know, what, 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 you know, everything you want out of life? So when we look at the scripture, specifically again, followers of Jesus, again, Jesus talking here in Luke 9, 23, he says to them all, if you guys want to be my disciple, anybody that wants that, must deny themselves. This idea of selflessness. We hear Jesus' followers over and over saying, I've left everything to follow you and take up their cross daily and follow me. It's an, such an interesting idea in, in the economy of the kingdom of God, how God flips things all the time. What you think is to get more stuff, that's what you need, but actually what you need is to have less of these things. So that's the first thing we wanna learn about what the peace of God is not. The second thing we wanna look at here, and this one's hard, this one's hard, is that we think the peace of God is, is God's removal of all the pain and suffering in our life. You know, again, who wants to suffer? I don't wanna suffer. I don't want pain. It's not cool, it's not fun. And I'll be honest, guys, I, I, you know, sometimes it's frustrating that I don't know why we're continually surprised by things that should be clear to us. I don't know if you encountered anybody today that was like, well, golly gee willikers, look, it's snowing out there today. You're like, dude, it's December in Northeast Ohio. What? Are you surprised, man? Welcome to Cleveland. You know, I mean, years ago when I started getting the old man hairs growing out the ears, I was surprised. But I'm not surprised anymore. I gotta shave those babies off or I'll walk around like Bilbo Baggins. You know, <laughs> why would I continue to be surprised? And yet, even though God's word tells us, tells us we're going to encounter trouble, Jesus talking about peace as my peace will leave you, why? In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. One of the quotes I heard just recently was, the birthmark of a believer is a bullseye. It's so true. Peter talking about there's this enemy, this lion prowling around, seeking who he can chew up and devour, right? It's a reality. We don't have to like it, but it's real, and we need to be ready for it. So the next thing we want to look at is that the peace of God, my personal unfavorite, is, is God changing other people. It's my unfavorite, if that's a word. Hey, Pastor Jim can make up words, so can I. Because this is probably my favorite prayer, man. This is, I have lived here most of my life. God, the reason I can't have peace is because this dude drives me crazy. Change that man. God, you know, I cannot stand my boss. He's such a jerk. Could you just change him? Then maybe I could have some peace. I mean, brothers, you, you know, you know that you've prayed this prayer. God, change my wife. God, she's crazy. <laughs> she has bought 32 bottles of hair products and lined them on my shower. I don't understand, God. And ladies, you know that you have prayed, God, change my husband. Because he's driving me crazy. Eating his full bag of Doritos, wiping his cheesy fingers all over my couch. This is what we do, you know. My problem is... These people, 
God, if you could just change these people, I'd be all right. Again, God's word is, is so helpful here. Why do we have the fruits of the Spirit? I mean, if God's job to bring us peace is just to change other people, why do I need patience with my children that will not get out of bed or change their clothes? Why do I need kindness if everyone is just kind to me? And, and why in the world would I need self-control? Who wishes the fruit of the Spirit was others' control? I do. Be like, right now, you are enjoying this message more than any message you have ever heard. <laughs> you will leave kind comments on the web and attend open door for the rest of your life. <laughs> not happening, man. I'm not Professor X, you know? I can't control people's mind. I need self-control. I need to control myself. That's the fruit of the Spirit. So we, we go through this list we look down again, so the peace of God is not God just giving us whatever we want, although God wants good things for us, doesn't he? It's not God removing all pain and suffering, but man, he sure does take away a lot. And although God brings many changes in the world, his peace in our life is not depending on him changing other people to accommodate us. So what is the peace of God? What do we wanna look at today? So first of all, the peace of God is this. It's God giving us not necessarily what we want, but what we need. Thinking back to our, our passage right now, I'm thinking about the shepherds and they're out watching their flocks, right? And man, of all the things these homeboys could have needed, man, maybe a space heater, you know? That'd be nice. God, how about one of those like uh, invisible electric fences that keeps the sheep all lined up so I don't have to worry about it? Or maybe some, some iTunes, some nice slow jams out there on the hillside, you know? I could, I could use some of this stuff. But instead, God sends them into town to find a baby. <laughs> a baby. Because God knew what they needed, what you need, what I need, is a savior. And his name is Jesus. And that's who was born that day. God gives us what we need. Jesus himself, I love Jesus. John 15, we all know this passage, a lot of us, the vine and the branches. Jesus himself saying, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you're gonna bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do Nothing, nothing. Don't we see this all the time, man? People, again, that seem like they have everything in life that should bring them peace. Everything in life to make them be at that place of complete satisfaction. And it's not happening. It's not happening for them. These celebrity suicides, people clinically depressed because apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Life apart from Jesus is nothing. He's what we need. Philippians, the author Paul talking about this. God is going to meet all of our needs according to his riches. How? How does he meet all of our needs? In Christ Jesus. That's it. Every need is met in Jesus Christ. So it's interesting to me that these shepherds who... There's a very good chance in Bethlehem that these were shepherds guarding what, what is referred to as temple flocks. Temple flocks. So these weren't any ordinary sheep. These were lambs being raised to be used as sacrifices in the temple. They had to be perfect. They had to meet strict standards to be able to be used and here these shepherds are who have raised these sacrificial lambs being sent into town to find the sinless, perfect Son of God, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So what we need is Jesus. The next thing that we learn is that the peace of God is God's redemption of man through Jesus' pain and suffering. Again, we have, to, we have to remember where we're 
at at this time. And man has been separated from God because of our sin. We have no access to God. We have no way to get to God, no way to work our way toward God. We've been separated from him by sin and the law because the law was there and there's no way we can fulfill the whole law. And again, thinking about these, these shepherds, they would know the temple and they would understand the temple and in the middle of the temple there, there was something referred to as the Holy of Holies where God himself dwelt. And nobody, nobody was allowed to go in there except for the high priest once a year to make atonement for the nation of Israel. And they would tie a rope onto his ankle in case he died in there in the presence of God, they could literally pull him out. And in front of that was a veil, more like a giant curtain. Some people think it was up to four inches thick that was a symbolic reference to our separation from God. Our separation from God. So enter Jesus, and we have this amazing redemption that he brings, and I wanna have us look at this great passage in Ephesians. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the people of Ephesus. Some people say Ephesus. I think Ephesus is more fun. And this is what he has to say here. I'm in Ephesians 2. Verses 13 through 19, and, and we read this about Jesus. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, you've been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who was made the two one and who has destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility between us and God by abolishing in his flesh, in his body, the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. And this is where it gets so good, man. For through him, we both, Jews and Gentiles, we have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, as a consequence, a beautiful consequence of what Jesus did, you're no longer foreigners and aliens, you're fellow citizens with God's people. And you're members of God's household. We were separated, but no more. How? When we look at Isaiah, we see what Jesus had to do to accomplish abolishing this hostility. And I hope it never gets old for you. It never gets old for me when we look at this because we need to understand that he was pierced he was pierced for our transgressions, our sins. He was crushed. The sinless Savior was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought you peace, that brought me peace, well, that was all on Jesus. He took it all, all of it. And by his wounds, we are healed. You know, it, it, it's amazing that that would ever get old to us or that we would ever lose that reality, but we do. And, and we need to remember that Jesus, just, again, wasn't up there on the cross to do this, to, to, to point you to this and have you look back and say, yep, this is you, man, you big bad sinner, you worthless human, I've got to drag myself up here and do this. No, Jesus is here with outstretched arms and not having the cross be the revelation of your sin and your failures in life. Jesus is up there with the most precious eyes of love saying this cross right here is a revelation of your value to me and to my Father. This is how far 
we're willing to go to bring peace between you and him. Because before, with the law and our sin, we had no way, no way to get to God. And what was interesting, the moment Jesus died, the moment he said, it is finished, that curtain, that veil we talked about, that puppy split from top to bottom right in half. That was God's way of saying, I've accepted Jesus' sacrifice and it's all been made right. And now, in an unfathomable reality, we can have a relationship with God and be members of his household through the belief in what Jesus did on the cross. Man, that should give us tremendous peace for those of us that have placed our faith and trust in Jesus. Tremendous, tremendous peace. And because of that, we don't worry about God necessarily changing other people because when you truly understand your own depravity, and how far you are from God and the punishment that we were supposed to have that we didn't get because of his love, because of his sacrifice. God's grace changes us. God's grace changes us. That's the change that God is looking for, that the cross is supposed to produce. I love, you know, we have, again, the Apostle Paul. We're gonna flip right over to Galatians. Galatians chapter six verses 14 through 16, and here was this, this zealous guy for the law, this, this Pharisee named Saul who was persecuting the church for years, these followers of Jesus, and he has this encounter with Jesus Christ. He's opened up to this reality of a true relationship outside of the law with God, and Paul it, there's changes happening in him. And he's talking to the church in Galatians who are trying to go back to the law and trying to work their way to God. And he says this beautiful thing. He says, listen, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cross through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I'm free from that stuff now. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation, the change that the cross produces. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. You see, we, we find the peace of God when we experience peace with God. That's the only place to find the peace of God, isn't it? In a relationship with the Father. In a relationship with Jesus. And again, when we experience that, like Paul, like anyone that has truly encountered a love relationship with the Father like that, it produces a change in you. And God allowed his peace in to that place, that dark place where we need it the most. For us, you and me, the church, the followers of Jesus, to be peace out. Right? That's what he did. We're not just now supposed to sit around in some Zen state because we've been forgiven and just wait for God to come back and take us all up out of here, out of this horrible place, right? Now, when I've truly let this hit my heart and it's grabbed me, I'm to be peace out. That same peace, peace out to my family. Peace out to that cashier that never wants to smile at me. Peace out to that guy that just cut me off on the road. And I don't lift up my middle finger, my savior was lifted up for me. So I can give that guy peace. Peace out, that's what God wants for us today. And that's where I wanna end, guys. I talked about Today, this, this reality of, of my heart being so full. And it is because, like Paul, I've experienced this so much. Man, it's why I'm up here. It's why with every breath that I breathe, I want people to live out of this reality. Because I've been that guy. That it was everybody else why my life was no good right now. 
My boss, my kids, my neighbor, my wife, the government, it was everybody else. If people could just help Johnny J out, I could have some peace in my life. And the peace of the Father, the peace of Jesus came into my life and it wrecked everything in the most beautiful way. <laughs> just, just blasted it out, man. And all I want people to do is say, you got to experience this. It's so real. It's so good. But just like you guys, and just like that picture we looked at earlier of the dove, things constantly come to jack with that, to try to take it out. And as I was preparing this message on the peace of God, a brother of mine, close friend, someone that goes to open door, broke bread with many times, did ministry with, encouraged me in ways I can't even begin to tell you. Two weeks ago, my friend took his own life. And I have never ever been through anything like that. And I'd be lying to say my peace didn't get rattled. Not my faith in my father, but boy, my peace took a hit. I have not worked with any man as much as I worked with this particular guy. And I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to be able to make it all right, right? God, what, what, how could this happen? How can I even begin to grapple with this? How can I have peace with something like this? And I kept throwing my questions up, man. I was hurting. And over and over and over. It wasn't an answer so much as it was just God saying, John, I'm with you. I'm with you. And you're like, that, that doesn't make sense. How can I find peace in that? And that's the last thing we need to learn about the peace of God. Listen, guys, the Bible's clear. There's something in the peace of God that literally passes our understanding. It's the peace that passes understanding. I thought, how can I get up here this Sunday and talk about the peace of God when, when this has happened with my friend? Because it's something that has passed my understanding. And I know this, I know there's someone out here today feeling the same way right now. So how could I not get up here and talk about my father and the love that he's given me? And here's where I want us to end and here's where God is leading us. There are people out here not experiencing this peace. Followers of Jesus, right here. Avon Lake, Vermilion, right in this room. You've had issues in your family. It's a mom and a daughter or a son in a broken relationship over a conversation that turned bad maybe years ago, maybe weeks ago, and there's no peace. It's a husband and a wife with divorce proceedings going on right now or they're flirting with it or they're sitting here this morning and they're not even talking. And the peace of God is wanting to come in and reign right now in this place. Today, guys, today we bring the peace of God in here and allow him to rule right now. Listen, no more. That was God, what God was telling me, I'm with that. No more. And you're thinking, hey, listen, there's no way, there's no way that I could rectify this, this relationship with my neighbor. There's no way to be peace out to that guy. There is no way for me to be peace out to my child that has hurt me in so many ways. There's no way that I could do this in my marriage. But there is. Jesus made a way. Didn't he? He's our peace. He's what you need. You know, it's not focusing on the person. It's focusing on what's already been done for you. And so as the worship team comes up, 
I want you guys to start thinking about where you need peace in your home today. And maybe that person's sitting right beside you. And right now, right now, a husband need to grab their wife's hand. That's it. That's, that's just letting them know. I'm hearing no words right now. My arm's around you. My hand is on yours. I am sorry. It's a parent that knows the first thing they have to do when they leave this room is call their child, grab their child, talk to their child in an effort to make peace, the peace that God has given you to push it out. How could we not? After all we've been forgiven for, how could we withhold that from someone else? When Jesus made a way. And so as this song plays, that's what I want you to think about because that's what I do. Guess what? I can't do it. Aren't you thinking that? I can't do it. Listen, we've heard that phrase, you know, there's no I in team. There's no I in peace. Jesus is going to do it for you. He's going to make the way. He's going to give you the strength. And it's going to happen today. It's going to happen today. We're going to make peace. I was walking down the streets of Jerusalem. And we were on the Via Dolorosa the, the traditional path where Jesus carried his cross. And I love going back there because that place in my mind, I, I, I was kind of annoyed that day. There was, there was people all around me, people pushing me, and you know, I'm trying to keep up with the group that we were on the tour with. You know, the people were hassling me. There were these cobblestones, and I was tripping. People barking at me from the sides, and I almost missed it, guys. I almost missed my heart breaking again, just thinking about Jesus carrying his cross down these roads, tripping and falling, people buying lettuce. It's selling things. And they didn't even know that the Savior of the world was right there, walking by, making a way to make peace. And I was thinking, you know, he did this for me because he loves me and for you guys. How did he make it this far? And in my mind, I just kept picturing Jesus saying, I just got to take one more step. I just gotta take one more step because I wanna get them back with their father. So today, whatever it is, whatever peace you need to make, when you're thinking about what you can't do, I want you to think about what Jesus did for you. So Father, right here, I know you're talking to people, God. Right now, that guy, Yep, mm-hmm, you, you know, man, come on. Holy Spirit, give him the courage, give him the grace. Squeeze her wife's hand, let him know, I'm sorry, I love you, I wanna make peace. Because Jesus, you're our peace. And for those wives that think, there's no way I can forgive, there's no way I can let it go, Holy Spirit. Let them know, remind them that you made a way. And let that peace spill in. God, let us be peace out in this church. God, let us be peace out in our homes. God, let us be peace out in our communities. You said we're the light of the world because you dwell inside of us. Let it be, let it be. Nobody leaves today. Father, grab them without making peace. Nobody. Bring them to the altar. Bring them to their knees. Bring them wherever they need to go in their mind, God. Today, we make peace. In Jesus' name, amen.